We're living in the 18th century now, in the revolutionary period. I want you to look at a chronology because we're going to be discussing a number of different subjects today. We're going to be discussing the nature of the sublime, and we're going to be discussing the nature of human independence. We're going to be discussing freedom for slaves. We're going to be discussing freedom for women. And we're going to be discussing those writers who articulate principles, ideas, and thoughts that are both revolutionary and anti-revolutionary. Let's look at this calendar. First of all, in 1762, Jean-Jacques Rousseau wrote The Social Contract. In The Social Contract, he expresses his opinions about an independent life and a free life. A life that reduces itself to a primitive state. In 1775, the Battle of Lexington and Concord and the initiation of the American Revolutionary War with the Declaration of Independence in 1776 leading to the War of Ind uh, for Independence. Now, so much of, the, of what we've been discussing this year has led to a country where you have a republic, a form of a democracy, and states in a continent embracing freedom of religion. The protests, the religious conflicts, the wars that we've seen throughout the period culminate in the American Revolution culminate in an ideal that people can have a representative government and that the government serves the will of the people. In 1780 we have a different story. The same year as Yorktown we have the Gordon Riots. The English wanted to give citizenship to the Roman Catholics. Parliament passed a law according citizenship, and the people of England revolted against it. They wanted no part of it, and a thousand people died on the streets of England in protest of Roman Catholic citizenship. It did not come until the next century. In 1788, we had the chimney sweep law. We mentioned Blake last time. And his poem about the chimney sweep, well, in 1788, the chimney sweep law passed to prevent youngsters from being forced into a profession where they would suffer cancers and carcinogenic disease. The French Revolution came in 1789. A bloody revolution that deposed the king of France and the queen of France, Marie Antoinette. A revolution so bloody that it horrified the English and many turned against the French Revolution, although there were some who accepted it for its liberal promises and premises. It's thought that had not the French Revolution been so bloody, there would have been an equivalent revolution in England at the end of the 18th century in protest to autocratic and oligarchic government. In the same year that the French Revolution began, the American Constitution was written. And it's a document brilliant in its enunciation of rights a document not perfect in the beginning, but more perfect when it added the Bill of the Rights, rights. and a document with anomalies. All men are created equal, but some are counted less than others, and women yet don't have the vote. 
So we're always moving progressively forward, not progressive in a socialist way, but progressive in the sense that eventually the vote will come and eventually slavery, well, eventually slavery will end and eventually the vote will come. In 1792, France was named a republic, and in 1793, you had the execution of Louis XIV, with Britain declaring war on France. We're frightened with, about terrorists in the year 2004, as a consequence of the destruction of the World Trade Center in the year 2001. And we have guards at the airports, and we have careful screening of our flights. But imagine what it was in England in 1793, when Britain declared war on France. And in the entire east coast of Britain had troops waiting for an invasion from France. And the troops were billeted in private houses. The troops were billeted in inns. William Blake opposed one of those soldiers and threw him out of his garden and was accused of treason for some of the statements he made and feared for his life, although in a trial by jury he was found innocent of these charges. But imagine worrying about the entire east coast of the United States being invaded by a neighbor so close that you could see the sails on their ships as they passed by your island. In 1794, we had the fall of Robespierre, who led the bloody revolution. What other events were happening? Thomas Paine wrote The Age of Reason. The Irish Wolf Tone Rebellion began to declare Ireland its freedom, or at least its dependency to the extent that it became a recognized nation in the English uh, Commonwealth. And by 1801, Ireland finally was admitted to the Commonwealth. In 1798, lyrical ballads were written, the lyrical ballads were written by Wordsworth and Coleridge, arguing in the Romantic movement, which had already been developing for almost 50 years. In 1799, we have Napoleon's coup d'etat. 1800, the Act of Union with Ireland, and 1804, Napoleon crowned emperor. And this, the English feared. Again, the possibility of an invasion on the entire East Coast by a country so near that your ships would engage in battle very close, even in the English Channel. Eighteen eleven, George the Third was declared incompetent. Eighteen twelve, we had war with the United States and England, the war of eighteen twelve. And finally in eighteen fourteen the defeat of Napoleon at Elba. 1820 saw the death of King George III, who had reigned for, 20, for 60 years. Now, the, the events are so tumultuous. The events are so traumatic. And the concerns of people for private liberty were so profound that we have writers who begin to enunciate and declare their positions on these issues. But first, however, it's worthwhile to understand artistically what was happening as well. And I want to turn briefly to Edmund Burke's essay on the sublime. You have a small excerpt in your book and let's see what he says here. Edmund Burke lived from 1729 to 1797, a major figure in English Parliament, 
but a man who violently opposed the French Revolution. He didn't violently oppose it, but he ardently opposed the French Revolution and was opposed, of course, to the violence in it. But he took a philosophical position and a philosophical inquiry into the origin of our, ide of our ideas of the sublime and the beautiful, which he published in 1749. Now, we know that the sublime, the art of the sublime, was written by Longinus in, classical, in the classical period in an essay called Perihupsos, where he talks about what is wonderful, what is great, and what is terrific. Now, we use these terms quite loosely today. Oh, it's a wonderful show. It's a wonderful play. It's a wonderful way. Uh, he's a wonderful athlete. But the word wonder in this sense means that which places us in a sense of awe. The Grand Canyon is wonderful because it gives us such a sense of wonder of how it was created. We get a sense of wonder by the way animals move. Lizards move through rocks. Snakes move on the rocks. There's a Hebrew proverb that says there are three fourth uh, three things that are great and one thing I know not. The eagle in the sky, the ship at sea, the serpent on the rock, and the love of a man for a woman. These are all things, these are all items of wonder. The eagle soars and flies according to the wind patterns. The ship in stormy seas or in passive seas, always rides on top. The serpent accommodates itself to the shape of the rocks it slithers upon. And men and women also learn to compromise, to shape themselves to their circumstances. These are thoughts of wonder, and they are of cosmic proportion. What is great? Mountains are great. Large oceans are great. Massive trees and forests and jungles have a greatness beyond man's capacity himself to create. And therefore, what is great is attributed to a higher power, the deity. And a number of the founders of the Declaration of Independence were deists. They weren't sectarian, they didn't follow any particular religious sect, but they did believe in a higher being and they believed in God. What is terrific? Terrific is what terrorizes us. An electric storm terrorizes us. It's beyond our belief, it's power. Tornadoes terrify us. The dark sometimes becomes a terrific sensation. Because the darkness is the absence of light. And when the sun rises, we have a sense of wonder opposing the sense of the terrific. We use words in the sublime in quite a different way. But Burke adds another quantity to the sublime, and that is what is beautiful. And let's just look briefly at some of the theories that Burke has so we get some idea that we're dealing with a world that is not only political, but a world that has some, athletic, uh, 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 some aesthetic proportion to it. He discusses what astonishes us. He says, anything that gives us a sense of admiration anything that gives us a sense of reverence, anything that offers a sense of respect is an astonishing thing. And this is a, uh, a sense of the sublime. That state of the soul in which all its motions are suspended with some degree of horror. 
terror. I mentioned to you what terrorizes us. This is part of the sublime. Serpents and poisonous animals. Anything that is obscure. Power comes from fear, comes from darkness. People plot power moves in dark rooms, in secret rooms. Elias Canetti in uh, a book called Crowds and Power told us how dictators rise to power by appointing people over them who then force others to do their will, who themselves are then only empowered by forcing those below themselves to do their will. And consequently, dictators operate through fear coming from power. But power in the sense of the divinity is another situation. You follow moral laws because you're afraid of the consequences of death and sin. You follow moral laws because they help society organize itself and therefore the power of the deity helps shape us for fear of the consequences if we did not have a sense of order. He goes on to say that there are paintings or poetry and of painting or poetry he feels that poetry gives us a greater sense of the sublime than painting because painting becomes an artificial surface whereas poetry enters the mind. He says beautiful objects give us a sense of the sublime. Small birds Little beasts, the tens of thousands of different shapes of spiders give us a sense of beauty. Each one, its own creation. I know most people fear spiders. Most people want to step on spiders. But there are so many varieties of spiders, and each becomes its own creation, that examining this arachnid, I was going to say insect, but examining this arachnid and the various types of arachnids becomes a unique study itself of what is proportional and what is beautiful. He says, even smooth and polished surfaces of furniture gives you, give you a sense of beauty and move you toward the sublime. And he quotes William Hogarth. Remember, we said Hogarth, we had studied Hogarth with the Harless Progress. Well, Hogarth was a painter, and he wrote a book called The Analysis of Beauty, where he suggested that the most beautiful line is the figure S. And notice his paintings. This shows Molly Hackabout, who's being accosted by a prostitute who's going to lure her into the trade. And here is Robert Walpole's assistant at an inn which sells whiskey. The checkerboard suggests whiskey and it's the Bell Tavern. Here is Molly Hackabout's father with an address in his hand looking for a place to take her. In the meantime, the horse you see here is eating straw between pottery, and the pottery is about to fall. Well, when pottery falls in 18th century or Renaissance writing, you know that that is the breaking of the maidenhead. But in terms of aesthetics, notice that you cannot split this painting down the middle, otherwise you cut through the arm of the madam. You cannot cut through the middle, otherwise you cut through the clothing and you miss the head of Walpole's associate. But notice that if you follow the line from the top of the wagon, down her father's head and his back, down Molly Hackabout's hat, down the arm of the madam, across to her bustle, you have kind of an S. 
and follow again the sublime movement, the sublime artistry. As you move down the head, down the shoulder, down the arm, down to the horse's neck, you have another S. Or if you want to look at it another way, you have a flexible line which crosses over and you might say you've even created a chiasmus here. But that is artistry too. And that is sublimity. And Burke talks about what it is that is great, beautiful, terrific. He says the greyhound is more beautiful than a mastiff. An Arabian horse is better than a war horse. Women are mute, more beautiful than men. And so we get a very interesting impression of artistry and sublimity in the hands of Edmund Burke. We do know that the spirit of America is rising, the spirit of liberty, the spirit of freedom. And William Blake wrote a long poem called America. I just want to quote a few passages from it so you get some idea what he was thinking about when he described the American Revolution. And these are plates. Now for Blake, the spirit of the American Revolution is a mythic figure he created called Orc. O-R-C. Orc rises from the flames of hell in order to be the revolutionary spirit and he is going to dramatically change the mind of man. Orc is a poet. And Blake characterizes himself as Orc in that sense. Now we're going to see this in a moment, a picture of Orc. But first, look at Blake's view of the American Revolution, which in spirits, other revolutions, the French Revolution, the Greek Revolution, the Russian Revolution, revolutions in Latin America, all of these become part of the revolutionary movement that we see starting at this point in the 18th century. Lover of wild rebellion and transgressor of God's law, why dost thou come to angels' eyes in this terrific form. You see, it's a terrifying form, but it's a terrific in the sense that it is going to engender new ideas. The terror answered, I am orc, wreathed around the accursed tree. He, is, he says, that stony law I stamp to dust. A new law is coming, not an orthodox law that dictates through outmoded religions how to suppress people. But a new religion. We're going to scatter religion abroad to the four winds. And he goes on to describe the American Revolution. His purpose is to make the deserts blossom and the deeps shrink to their fountains. For Blake, he wants to get rid of religious oppression, that pale religious lechery, seeking virginity. He wants people to express themselves. <clears throat> he wants to celebrate everything that lives is holy. Life delights in life, says Blake. And that, of course, is the spirit of the American Revolution. Now, here we have Blake describing the revolution. Sound, sound my loud war trumpets and alarm my 13 angels. Those are the 13 colonies. This is Blake the Englishman celebrating the American Revolution. This was written in 1793. He's looking back. Loud howls the eternal wolf. The eternal lion lashes his tail. That's the British America is darkened, and my punishing demons, terrified, crouch, howling before their caverns deep, like skins dried in the wind. There is this sense of terror 
as power tries to reduce the American Revolution, but it will come out on top. They cannot smite with sorrows, nor subdue the plow and spade. They cannot smite the wheat, nor quench the fatness of the earth. They cannot smite with sorrows, nor subdue the plow and spade. They cannot wall the city, nor moat round, moat round the castle of princes. A new time is coming, and the British cannot control this new movement. And he begins to celebrate the leaders of the American Revolution. Children take shelter from the lightnings. There stands Washington and Payne and Warren with their foreheads reared toward the east. But clouds obscure my aged sight. A vision from afar. Sound, sound my loud war trumpets and alarm my 13 angels. And we see the revolution moving along. He says, I see thee in thick clouds and darkness on America's shore, writhing in pains of abhorred birth. And he goes on to celebrate the movement of the American soldier, the American, the American movement toward independence. Shaking their mental chains, they rush in fury to the sea to quench their anguish. These are the British. At the feet of Washington, down, fallen, they grovel on the sand and writhing lie while all the British soldiers through the 13 states sent up a howl of anguish, threw their swords and muskets to the earth and ran from their encampments and dark castles seeking where to hide. George Washington and the others have destroyed the British spirit and destroyed the British cause. And he goes on to tell us who is coming up from, from the grim flames and from the visions of Orc in sight of Albion's angel. And now we have Orc again fighting against Albion's angel, and Albion represents England. The numbers, here we have it, plate 14. In the flames stood and viewed the armies, and these are the people Blake celebrates, drawn out in the sky, Washington, Franklin, Payne, and Warren, Gates, and Lee, and heard the voice. Now I'm going to show you a picture of Orc, this figure that Blake has created. There is Orc. There is that revolutionary figure. There is the spirit of America, the spirit of liberty, the spirit of fury, the spirit of revolutionary ardor who is now rising from chains below the earth and as a poetic spirit with fury and with armies marching behind him with power and with the spirit of the poet and the spirit of the artist and the spirit of the revolutionary movement, Blake gives us this powerful image of Orc. The American Revolution was one movement. Another movement we're going to look at is William Culper's The Negro's Complaint. Culper lived from 1731 to 1800. And in 1789, the year of the French Revolution, in 1789, the year the American Constitution was signed. 1789, William Culper writes the Negro's complaint. Culper felt that the 
sense of freedom that was being engendered throughout the world ought to be allowed the black slaves, the Negro slaves in captivity. Culper was a Calvinist. He felt, as all Calvinists do, that they are predestined and that every one of them who demonstrates success in this world will sit at the right hand of God afterwards. Cowper felt he was predestined. He felt that he should sit at the right hand of God, but he was also paranoid and felt that he would be one of those who would ultimately be forsaken. The end of his life was not a pleasant one. When you think you're going to be, when you know you should be saved, but also feel you will not be. But for the slave, he felt salvation was necessary and freedom should be at hand. And he gives us this poem where a slave complains about his situation. Now he starts by saying, and this is the slave talking, forced from home and all its pleasures, Africa's coast I left forlorn, to increase a stranger's treasures o'er the raging billows born. Men from England bought and sold me, paid my price in paltry gold. But though slave they have enrolled me, mines are never to be sold. Now that's a powerful poem. I'd like to note one characteristic of this poem, and that is the rhyme scheme. Notice it's pleasures and treasures, forlorn and born, gives you A, B, A, B. Then me and me and gold and sold give you A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D. But these are not simple rhymes. These are not trite rhymes. These are not rhymes that are simply there to match words with. These are rhymes that have an intrinsic motif to them, an intrinsic meaning. For example, the rhyme pleasures and treasures suggests mercantilism. People enjoy pleasures when they get treasures from the slave trade. The idea that he is forlorn, though he is and is born elsewhere, suggests his transportation. The slave is sold for gold, and therefore you have mercantilism. And finally, he has that triple rhyme. He sold me and enrolled me, and therefore this man, this African, is no longer free. He's on the list. Let's look at the next stanza. Still in thought, as free as ever, what are England's rights, I ask? Remember, Aquino gained freedom in England, but this slave is in the Barbados, and this slave is in the Caribbean without the opportunity for freedom. Still in thought, as free as ever, what are England's rights, I ask? Me, from my delights to sever, me to torture, me to task, is this their purpose? Fleecy locks and black complexion cannot forfeit nature's claim. Skins may differ, but affection dwells in white and black the same. There is an equ equanimity between people, whatever their color. Notice the rhyme scheme here and how brilliant it is. He says, I would like to live as ever, but I am severed from this pure life. Therefore, we have antithesis. He says, why do I ask? Why am I assigned this task, though you have the question of justice? <clears throat> 
He says our complexion and affection, we should have an affection for each other regardless of our complexion. And now you have the issue of compassion. And finally he says, nature gives us all equal rights. Nature's claim means that blacks are the same. And you have a sense of empathy. Notice how the rhyme scheme gives us the motifs of the poem and makes it important to us. Third stanza. Why did all creating nature make the plant for which we toil? That's the cotton. Sighs must fan it, tears must water, sweat of ours must dress the soil. Think ye, masters, iron-hearted, lolling at your jovial boards, eating a good supper. Think how many blacks have smarted for the sweets your cane affords. Now he uses cane in a double meaning there. Sugar cane is what they're eating, but these slaves are beaten with a cane as well. You can get the double implication there, but what are the major themes here? Nature and water gives us tears. Toil and soil understand labor. Iron-hearted taskmasters have forced us, have beaten us, have flogged us, so that our skin has smarted. And if you like to eat at a good dinner table, if you like to go to a good restaurant, if you enjoy jovial boards, it's because the sugar cane affords, or the master's cane forces these people to work. He says, don't you believe in God? The fourth stanza says, is there, as ye sometimes tell us, is there one who reigns on high? Has he bid you buy and sell us, speaking from his throne, the sky? Remember, Culper is a Calvinist. He's a sectarian. He's a religionist. But he's looking at his fellow religionists as being hypocrites for maintaining the slave trade. Ask him, that's God, ask him if your knotted scourges, fetters, blood extorting screws are the means which duty urges against uh, agents of his will to use. Ask him if your knotted scourges, fetters, Blood extorting screws are the means which duty urges agents of his will to use. Does he tell you to use these torturous instruments? Is that what your God tells us? So this becomes a religious satire. Tell us, why do you sell us? Where is God high in the sky? Who urges the use of these scourges. And is it God's will? To have people use blood extorting screws? So what you have here is religious satire. An essence and study of God's presence. A sense of the slave owner's cruelty and religious sarcasm. This poem gets more bitter in Culper's hands. As the abolitionist movement becomes more forceful, and by 1807, the slave trade had been banned in England. What is God's will? You know, when you're in the Barbados, when you're in the Caribbean, when you're in Texas, we suffer hurricanes and we suffer tornadoes. And in the minds of men, the, these are samples or examples of God's wrath brought on men for his sins, men for their sins. Here's God's will. Hark, he answers. Wild tornadoes strewing yonder sea with wrecks, wasting towns, 
plantations, meadows, are the voice with which he speaks. He, foreseeing what vexations Afric's sons should undergo, fixed their tyrant's habitations where his whirlwinds answer no. These storms come. They wreck these plantations. They wreck the homes of the plantation owners. They rip up the sugar cane. And this is, as far as the Negroes talking here, these are God's responses to the slave trade. When we talk about the tornadoes and the meadows that God brings, and we say he speaks with the wrecks of the plantations, this is called providential history. Biblical history is providential. God will bring about storms. God will bring about... God will destroy the enemies, and God will give manna to those he favors. Providential vengeance are the habitations which are destroyed with God's vexations. And the answer we ultimately want, we undergo an answer, and the answer is no, don't do this. This is providential will. And men, by maintaining the slave trade, are violating the providential will. The sixth stanza. By our blood in Africa wasted, ere our necks receive the chain. By the miseries we have tasted crossing in your barks the main. That is, the slaves have been in these ships in the middle voyage. By our sufferings, since you brought us to the man-degrading mart, all sustained by patience, taught us only by a broken heart. We don't want to be here. We've been forced into these slave auctions, the man-degrading mart. And look again how the rhymes carry the themes. Wasted and tasted suggests the futility of people who are in the slave trade. Chain and the main slave suggest transportation. You brought us, you taught us this misery, the sense of reality. And our hearts are broken in the, mar in the marketplace. This becomes the slave auction. And finally, the last statement, the new vision for a better world in this abolitionist document. Deem our nation brutes no longer, till some reason ye shall find worthier of regard and stronger than the color of our kind. Think about a higher power. Slaves of gold, you slave owners, slaves of gold whose sordid dealings tarnish all your boasted powers, prove that you have human feelings ere you proudly question ours. We're not considered human beings in your mind. Now let's look at the final rhyme here. No longer should we endure this kind of punishment. We should look for a stronger future, a new vision. We will find people who will understand our kind. This is abolition. We want dealings with people who understand our feelings. This is the paradox of wealth and human kindness. And finally, the power will be ours. The ultimate value will be the recognition that all of us have the same right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, this is a powerful poem, the Negro's complaint. If you're going to study it, if you're going to write about it, if you're going to synthesize its viewpoints, look at the rhymes. Look at how artfully 
helper gives us the sense of the entire poem in the rhymes themselves. A powerful piece of poetry. Now I'd like to look at two works. One is Burke on France in 1790, horrified with Robespierre's bloody guillotine, fearful of the French invading England. We have Edmund Burke writing on reflections on the revolution in France and on the proceedings in certain societies in London relative to that event. Now, Burke is the opposite of Blake. Blake celebrated the French Revolution even at its bloodiest because he said he saw reform, he saw a cleansing, he saw a fire that was destroying the old regime, the ancien regime, and he saw a new governance coming out of it. Burke, however, thinks differently. Burke says, if civil society be the offspring of convention, that convention must be law. We want order, and law gives us order. And once you break that order, you are lawless. He goes on to say, the moment you abate anything from the full rights of men, each to govern himself and suffer any artificial positive limitation upon those rights. From that moment, the whole organization of government becomes a consideration of convenience. You cannot have people arbitrarily asserting their own rights, arbitrarily bringing down rulers, arbitrarily destroying the social and governmental structures already in effect. He says, then you have chaos. He says, in France, you are now in the crisis of a revolution. And in the transit from one form of government to another, you cannot see that character of men exactly in the same situation in which we see it in this country. He said, there is a change there. We have to acknowledge it. But look at his next statement. Plots massacres, assassinations, seem to some people a trivial price for obtaining a revolution. Cheap, bloodless reformation, a guiltless liberty, appear flat and vapid to their taste. He says we should be able to achieve revolution bloodlessly. We should be able to achieve reform without violence. And when you move toward violence, according to Burke, you are only giving us bloody massacres and assassinations and a cheap revolution. He says, this revolution, my dear sir, writing, was not the triumph of France. I must believe that as a nation it overwhelmed you with shame and horror. I must believe that the National Assembly find themselves in a state of the greatest humiliation. He says, for most people, there is no justice here. For most people, there is no order. For most people, there is no reform. There is only bloodletting, revolution, violence, death, horror, and the kind of terror that subjects one group of people to another. He goes on to say, this assembly which overthrows kings and kingdoms has not even the physiognomy and aspect of a grave legislative power. He says they have no other capability, and look at the last lines of that paragraph, but to achieve further subversion 
and further destruction. And then he goes on to talk about the death of Louis and Antoinette. History will record that on the morning of the 6th of October, 1789, the king of, and queen of France, after a day of confusion, alarm, dismay, and slaughter, lay down under the pledged security of public faith to indulge nature in a few hours of respite and troubled melancholy repose. They had nothing to do but exhausted, try to seek sleep. From this sleep, the queen was first startled by the sentinel at her door who cried out to her to save herself by flight. That this was the last proof of fidelity he could give that they were upon him and he was dead. The guard warned the queen to get out. He was killed. He was murdered. Instantly, he was cut down. A band of cruel ruffians and assassins, reeking with his blood, rushed into the chamber of the queen and pierced with a hundred strokes of bayonets and poniards the bed from whence this persecuted woman had just had time to fly, almost naked, and through ways unknown to the murderers, had escaped to seek refuge at the feet of a king and husband, not secure of his own life for the moment. So she sought her husband and he could give her no assurance of safety. And here is Burke trying to describe the violence, the terror, the ruin of a kingdom. Mind you, he is loyal to George III. He's loyal to the British kingdom. He's loyal to a monarchy. And he's horrified to see a monarchy being destroyed because it can happen in England too if they're not careful. He said the king and the queen were forced to abandon the sanctuary of the most splendid palace in the world, Versailles, which they left swimming in blood, polluted by massacre, and strewed with scattered limbs and mutilated carcasses. Here you have him using every set of words intended to heighten the horror of this particular situation. And this is not the horror of the sublimity, because this is the horror of man's uncompromising and animalistic revolutionary spirit, which he which Burke objects to. Not Blake, by the way. Two of the bodyguards were publicly dragged to the block and beheaded in the great course of the palace. Their heads were stuck upon spears and led the procession where the king and queen had to follow. Burke goes on to describe these situation. He said, after they had been made to taste the king and queen, after they had been made to taste drop by drop, drop more than the bitterness of death, in the slow torture of a journey of 12 miles, protect, protracted to six hours, they were under a guard, uh, they were under a guard composed of those very soldiers who had thus conducted them through this famous triumph, now converted into a Bastille for kings. And he goes on to talk about the death of the king and Queen of France. Well, this is Burke. Horrified by this revolution. Blake entranced in celebrating the revolution. Culper seeking his own revolution in the end of the slave trade. And now we're not going to look at another figure. We're going to look at Mary Wollstonecraft, a woman who sees a different type of fight. And this is the fight for women's rights. Mary Wollstonecraft, 1789-1814. 
wrote in 1790, uh, lived from 1759 to 1797, died at the same time as Burke, lived a shorter life than Burke. Burke was 30 years older than she. She writes a vindication of the rights of women. If we sought liberty for all men, if we sought liberty for slaves, if we sought liberty for Frenchmen, we should seek liberty for women. And Mary Wollstonecraft in 1792 writes A Vindication of the Rights of Women. She writes this book in 13 chapters. I'm going to go through the titles just briefly with you and then we'll look at some of the text that Mary Wollstonecraft wishes to present to the men in her world and the world that has looked upon women as inferior creatures. Women not given the vote. Women not given the education. Women withheld from public office because of outmoded ideas of primitivism and a social order celebrated by Rousseau, which Mary Wollstonecraft rejects. The social contract, she said, is a contract for men to celebrate men, to continue the suppression of women, and deny them their independent spirit. And so we're going to conclude by looking at Mary Wollstonecraft's book, A Vindication of the Rights of Women. She begins with an introduction that tries to put all in perspective, and then goes to chapter one, the rights and involved duties of mankind considered. What is our role in society? How do we function? Chapter 2 and chapter 3 discuss the prevailing opinion of sexual character discussed. Why are men in ascension? Why are women restricted to fashions and to childbearing? Why are men involved in the affairs of state? And why are women limited to the affairs of home? Chapter 4, she devotes to the observations on the state of degradation to which women is reduced by various causes. She goes on to talk about the animate versions of some of the writers who have rendered women objects of pity bordering on contempt. She mentions Rousseau. She mentions the Dr. James Fordyce. She mentions Chesterton and his famous letters to his son. We'll put that in here. And you have a brilliant chapter Five, in which she tries to assess these various people who have celebrated in the writings the virtues and the education of men but not the virtues and education of women. She talks about the effect which an early association of ideas has upon the character. Now, John Locke speaks about the association of ideas. He says we are born as a tabula rasa, and everything we experience fills up this blank slate, this blank page. And whatever is on this page grows by means of association. <laughs> 
That is, once we know that there's a horse, and once we know that there's a man, we can create a centaur to show the wisdom of the one combined with the procreative capability and power of the other. So we can associate ideas. You can also see a mother and a father and associate love for a child. Although the adverse may be true, there are families that see a mother and child, or a father, and see the abuse of a child. There was a priest, a Catholic priest in Erie, Pennsylvania, years ago, who had youngsters under his charge whom he wanted to teach the Bible to. But he had a problem when he spoke about God as Father because these young men associated their father with someone who abused them, who beat them, who broke their bones. And so, if you want them to respect God, you better call him something else than father. Because the association of ideas was so powerful that they were terrified by the brutal fathers whose homes they had been withdrawn from, whose homes they no longer inhabited, as social air agencies and church groups took them out for their own protection. She says, if a girl grows up thinking that she should be concerned with dresses, toilet tables, perfumes, hairdos, making dinner and caring for children, and that's her only responsibility, and then for the rest of her life, that's all she will do. Worry about the dresses she wears, seek fine clothing, gain enterprise in needlework, and never, never gain the education that men have gained. If you grow up in a society whose associations limit you, then you will be limited. If you grow up in a, in a society where associations are granted you, where you have the opportunity to draw associations, then you'll be a wiser person. And Mary Wollstonecraft sought for a wiser woman, a more educated woman, a more intelligent woman, and a more independent woman. She goes on to discuss modesty, number seven, comprehensively considered, not as a sexual virtue. What's the difference between modesty and love? Modesty in marriage? Modesty amongst couples? How does one gain a share of equality? Eight, she talks, chapter eight, she talks about morality is undermined by sexual notions of the importance of a good reputation. And you have to read the chapter in order to discover how morality arrogates or how one commands a moral pose in the guise of a man as opposed to the necessity of a moral pose in the guise of a woman. Number 10, he talks about, she ta number 9, uh, uh, chapter 9, she talks about the pernicious effects which arise from the unnatural distinctions established in society. Women are harmed when they aren't educated. Women are harmed when they can't enter enterprise. Women are harmed when they can't own property. Women are harmed when they are treated as second class figures. Women are harmed when their children look to their fathers as superior figures and not to their mothers. She talks about parental affection, one's duty to one's parents, 
And then she gets into the field of a national education. Mary Wollstonecraft isn't happy with women learning at home. She says, when they're learning at home, they're not studying the classics necessarily. When they're learning at home, they're learning crafts. They're learning manners. They're learning how to set the table. They're learning how to curtsy. But they aren't getting the education that one would get if women were allowed to be educated in the same schools with men. And she feels that local education, home-taught education, is a way to suppress women and to force them into a mold, whereas she feels a national educational system where women went to schools with boys, where girls went to school with boys, would in fact give women the opportunity of learning they deserve. We're going to look at some of these sentences in a few moments. Chapter 13, she says, she gives us some instances of the folly which the ignorance of women generates with a concluding reflection, with concluding reflections on the moral improvement that a revolution in female manners might naturally be expected to produce. Now here's Mary Wollstonecraft talking about revolution. Not the American Revolution. Not the French Revolution. Not the abolitionist revolution. But a revolution of women's rights. In the 1790s. Let's look at some of these statements she makes in this book which she has uh, written. In her introduction, she says, my own sex, I hope will excuse me if I treat them like rational creatures. She's being a little sarcastic here. Most people don't expect you to treat women as rational creatures. She's going to do it. My own sex, I hope, will excuse me if I treat them like rational creatures instead of flattering their fascinating graces and viewing them as if they were in a state of perpetual childhood, unable to stand alone. I earnestly wish to point out in what true dignity and human happiness consists. I wish to persuade women to endeavor to acquire strength, both of mind and body, and to convince them that the soft phrases, susceptibility of heart, delicacy of sentiment and refinement of taste are almost synonymous with epithets of weakness. And that those beings who are only the objects of pity and that kind of love which has been termed its sister will soon become objects of contempt. Let's move on and see what else she has to say. She says in chapter 1, society therefore as it becomes more enlightened, should be very careful not to establish bodies of men who must be made foolish or vicious by the very constitution of their profession. And she talks about the infancy of society when men arriving and coming out of barbarism form governments, <coughs> governments which were not necessarily perfect. They led to intestine wars, foreign wars, insurrections. And she says men didn't necessarily do the job they should do. She objects to Jean-Jacques Rousseau's social contract. She says, let us examine this question. Rousseau declares that a woman should never for a moment feel herself independent that she should be governed by fear to exercise her natural cunning and made a coquettish slave in order to render her a more alluring object of desire, a sweeter companion to man 
whenever he chooses to relax himself. She despises Rousseau, considers him a hypocrite, claims that the social contract is <clears throat> meant for men and not for women. She goes on to say, what nonsense! When will a great man arise with sufficient strength of mind to puff away the fumes which pride and sensuality have thus spread over the subject? If women are by nature inferior to men, their virtues must be the same in quality, if not in degree. Or virtue is a relative idea. Consequently, their conduct should be founded on the same principles and have the same aim as ours. She goes on to discuss education. Here she says, we'll get, we'll get to the issue of education in a few moments. I come round to my old argument. If women be allowed to have an immortal soul, we assume we all have immortal souls, she must have, as the employment of life, an understanding to improve. And therefore, she is not a brute. She was not, she says, born only to procreate and rot. She has a reason to be educated and a reason to go to school not just to be a wife and mother of children. She says, why are girls to be told that they resemble angels, but to serve them below women? <clears throat> or that a gentle, innocent female is an object that comes nearer to the idea we have formed of angels. She says, uh, they may be angels, but they don't have the right to think. And that's what she's uh, telling us in this particular passage. She says, these are idle, empty words. And we don't want to hear idle, empty words anymore. We want to gain an education. And we want to join with others in the classroom. Chapter 9, she says... Would men but generously snap our chains and be content with rational fellowship instead of slavish obedience? Let's stop this enchaining of women. Let's put them on an equal level. Let's have equal partners. I'm going to move. She says, a slavish bondage to parents cramps every faculty of the mind. Let's move on, she says. Let's not enslave the mind. Let's get this education that all people deserve. Okay. Here she talks about education. I believe, she says in chapter 12, experience will ever prove that this kind of subordinate authority is particularly injurious to the morals of youth. What should we do? She says we should put boys and girls in the same hour. She said we would not have boys in serious study and women just in play acting. If we had an elementary day school where boys and girls, the rich and poor, should meet together. And to prevent any of the distinctions of vanity, they should be dressed alike and all obliged to submit to the same discipline. The schoolroom ought to be surrounded by a large piece of ground in which children might exercise and live a life together, boys and girls, all studying reading, writing, arithmetic, natural history, botany, and other subjects. She concludes her essay with this statement. <clears throat> 
in chapter 13. Let women share the rights, let a woman share the rights, and she will emulate the virtues of man. For me, she must grow more perfect when emancipated. She will grow more perfect when emancipated. And she concludes with a statement, O ye men of understanding, mark not severely what women do amiss. Allow her the privileges of ignorance to whom you deny the rights of reason. You must have and you must be given understanding. Well, we've had an interesting day today. We've looked at the American Revolution. We've looked at the French Revolution. We've looked at the slave revolution. And we've looked at the feminine rev revolution. And they're all part of the 18th century. There's a lot to write about for those of you, for those of you who continue your study in this period. Thank you.